Hey everyone. This is number four in the human rights um, series that I am doing. It's the rights of reproduction. Please watch one, two, and three before you watch this video because there are certain um, ideas that are established in those videos that are really kind of necessary to, to follow along with what I'm talking about. So we have established that humans have equal rights and that autonomy of body is a paramount right. I've discussed how this right is not an entitlement to tangible items or specific behavior, but simply an obligation to refrain from actions that breach others' autonomy. Everyone has that right and that moral obligation to everyone else automatically without anyone having to consent. Equality means that you can't have it unless you give it. Or, more precisely, not recognizing others' rights invalidates your own. As sentient, cognizant beings, we conceptualize responsibility, who is obliged to do what, as a way to keep our interactions fair and peaceful. It is the nature and cornerstone of civilization. There's more to being civilized than just refraining from breaching others' autonomy. Sometimes we do have obligations to act or give tangible items, but obligations to act are different from the automatic shared right of autonomy in a very important way. They are not automatic. Just as willingness is the key factor in the parameter of an individual's autonomy, so it is also the deciding factor in our obligations to act. Obligations must be a willful choice. Anything less is a violation of autonomy. However, nothing is 100%, not even that statement. Social obligations are mostly automatic, and conforming is not a moral issue, and so mostly beyond the scope of what I'm talking about here. Parenting is the biggest and, as it happens, most important obligation a human can have. In our children lies the future of society, and indeed, the life of humanity. How we choose to treat them has enormous impact on how they, as adults, will choose to treat others. Whenever possible, the obligations of parenthood should be a planned, informed, and willful choice. Children are unable to defend their rights or provide for their own needs, so it is inherent in the role of the parent the responsibility to provide for those needs and safeguard those rights. As the capable individuals in the situation and the ones whose actions caused the rights and needs to exist in the first place, parents bear this responsibility automatically. This qualifies as a moral obligation, meaning that to fail in this responsibility is to breach the inherent human rights of the child. Everything in a person or couples' lives, even their families' lives, has the potential to impact the rights of their child, even conditions pre-existing the child's birth. The place they live, the quality of their food, and the relative safety of their environment, among many other things, all fall under the obligation of the parent. Unwanted pregnancy is a completely unique circumstance where the legitimate will and rights of one person conflicts with the life and legitimate rights of another. I understand completely the thought process behind the paradigm that a woman should be prohibited from terminating a pregnancy. If the growing life is to have autonomy, then its body would have to be safeguarded from violations. However, if we are going to consider the fetus's right to autonomy, equality demands that we consider the woman's autonomy as well. There are two bodies involved and two sets of rights. If we are all equal in our rights, neither body has more autonomy than the other. Each person involved has the right to decline, or as I like to call it, veto power. This paradigm is evident in any case where more than one body is involved, as our attitudes towards sexual intercourse and even something like organ donation show. If one person is unwilling to physically engage, it should not be forced. Only two individuals have legitimate rights and therefore legitimate wills to be respected in the scenario of unwanted pregnancy. 
Interference by the will of an outside party would be a violation of autonomy. Responsibility should always be a factor in any potential birth. Of the two individuals physically involved, only one of them has a conscious will. Only one of them is faced with a moral obligation, and only one of them has the capacity to evaluate the situation surrounding the potential birth and whether or not the child's rights and needs can be safeguarded and fulfilled. Does a woman succeed in her obligation to her child by birthing her into an environment where physical abuse is certain, or when she knows that she has yet to learn to control her use of health-injuring or mentally incapacitating drugs, or when she has no means to buy food and clothing? If she knows that she will fail in her responsibility to protect rights or provide for needs, she isn't really accepting a moral obligation by choosing to have a child. She is simply setting an innocent up to have her rights violated. Having a child in a situation that breaches that child's rights or fails to provide for the child's needs is an immoral act. Termination of a pregnancy can, in some situations, be the responsible and moral choice. We cannot guarantee the rights of our children if we cannot control when and where they are brought into the world. Generally, we cannot hold individuals to an obligation they did not accept willingly. That's slavery. Slaves aren't happy, and they don't necessarily do a good job. Parenting, the biggest and most important obligation a human can have, can oblige a person without consent because every child born has innate rights. What we want is for parenting to be done well by those happy to do it. If we had a dangerously small population, there might be a duty to the survival of humanity to consider, the duty to birth, but in fact, our population right now is so big, coupled with the way the industrialized world lives, that it threatens our survival. If anything, an argument might be made that we have a duty to not birth and or adopt rather than birth, but... I digress. So when does the obligation to a child's rights and needs become valid? It can't be conception since the woman has a right to decline, and it can't simply be birth because the woman who chooses to ingest harmful sub substances during gestation is violating her fetus's right to his healthy body. You can't be obliged to a child you don't know you're carrying, and a pregnancy can sometimes be undetected for many weeks. Some people plan for years for a child. Others don't know what they want for a while after they find out there's a pregnancy. The moment you decide to be a parent, or the moment you become one if you didn't know or failed to decide, along with the moment any condition becomes relevant to the issue of the child's rights or needs, guide when this obligation becomes valid. It is not an exact moment for every situation. My camera's a piece of shit, so... <sighs> Moving on. There is, though, a natural limit to the amount of time a woman has to decide if she will deny these moral obligations. A woman cannot simply leave a newborn in a parking lot because she isn't willing to be a mother or engage in unhealthy activity when there is a chance she will decide to birth. That child has rights. Creating a viable life obligates her and the father. A fetus cannot have autonomy as long as its body cannot live without the protection of the mother's body. As it happens, a fetus becomes able to survive without the body of the mother or becomes viable before gestation ends. At this point, its right to autonomy cannot morally be breached because termination is no longer the only solution to ending the woman's physical involvement. The alternative, however, removing a viable fetus would free the woman from her physical participation but fails to support the new life's needs. She is still obligated to these needs unless she finds someone willing to take them on, but another person cannot complete gestation for her. A woman has an obligation to make her decision to abort prior to viability and to behave as though she is going to birth until she decides that she will not. Once the fetus is viable, her obligations are set. 
This, too, is not an exact moment for every situation. As usual, there are exempting conditions. A woman may find out at some point beyond viability that there's a threat to her life in a way that termination is her only defense or that there are biological problems affecting the quality of life for the fetus. And that's all I have on that issue, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention fathers. When it comes to gestation of a child within the mother, the father's body is not immediately involved, and so he has no autonomy to be considered. That's not sexism or inequality, that's just biology. Like I said earlier, nothing is 100%. There is at least one scenario where the man would have legitimate biological, moral, and social grounds to demand termination of a pregnancy. And that is the stealing of sperm. Which has been known to happen. There are a lot of other issues involved with the obligations of fatherhood, but again, are beyond the scope of this video. Thanks for sticking with me through my irritating cat and irritating camera. Thanks for watching.